Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it again. I'm going to follow the theme of playing with the, with the mic here. No, I really, I really am glad to be here, and I, I appreciate all, all the, the panelists, and thank you, Latham, for, for asking me to be here. Um, I would th- thank Chuck, but um, he's not here right now. But um, no, thank Chuck did a really good job this morning. So I've had a really good time, and I love, I love pizza. So, um, so I. I have been sober since May 4th of 2005, um, as my sobriety date. My home group is the Lost and Found uh, group in Marietta, Georgia. And I'm going to do what the book to- tells me to do, which is to share in a general way what it used to be like, what happened to me, and, and what it's like now as a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was born and raised in Atlanta, um, just outside of Atlanta, Marietta, and... I was born into an alcoholic family. My my father was an alcoholic, and his whole side of the family was alcoholics. I had an aunt die of this disease. Um, my grandfather died of this disease. and um, So my parents got divorced at a really young age. Um, I don't have much memory of my, my parents being together, and so I was raised by a um, single mom. She's She's an artist, and so... So funds were tight, and growing up, um, if you would have asked me if that if, if that had really an effect on my life, I would have told you no. Um, and it wasn't until actually getting sober that I realized that that yeah, it did have an effect on me. I think that that any child who goes through something like that and sees some of the things that I've seen is going to be effect, affected to some extent. Um, one of my earliest memories, I was recently trying to think of what my earliest memory was, and um, one of my earliest memories was coming home with my mom. It was it was snowing outside, so it doesn't happen a whole lot in Georgia, um, so it was really cold, and my dad was passed out drunk on the couch, and we were locked out of the house, and we couldn't wake him up and get in. Um, so from a, from an early age, I had an understanding of of alcoholism, and my mom did a really good job of trying to like educate me and re- tell me that my dad wasn't a bad person; he was a sick person. And I think sometimes she educated me a little too much because we would have like drug awareness week, drug and alcohol awareness week at school, and they would talk about alcoholics, and I would raise my hand and be like, "Ooh, my daddy's one of those. My daddy's one of those." <laughs> And, you know, my mom would have to sit me down after school and let me know, like, you know, Chase, like, we, you know, it's something that we can talk about here in the house, but we don't have to go broadcast that to everybody. But my mom really was a great mother growing up. Um, and, and I, and I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have alcohol present in my house very often living with my mom. I have a younger brother and it was, it was us three. I felt very different growing up. Um, my my dad didn't pay child support and we didn't so we didn't have much money and and kids would have the new clothes and I would have the the hand me downs from you know a friend's family who the kid was three years older than I was and the clothes weren't cool anymore and I noticed I noticed those little things growing up and, and it really affected me and not having a not having a father figure there's a lot of stuff that I had to learn on my on my own you know other kids had had a father figure to look up to taught them things and and I just felt like I wasn't I've heard a lot recently about people saying that they didn't get the handbook to life and that's the way I felt I felt different than than other people I felt like I didn't fit in and I and I would feel alone in a in a crowded room um I always, I've always been, been a people pleaser at my very core. And, and, and if I hung around you, I, I tried to change the way that I appeared, the way I acted to, to fit in with people. And so I went through lots of different groups of people growing up. Um, 
when I when I was in middle school, I didn't I didn't have like hardly any friends at school. Um, I, I I had other groups of friends, other places, and so when I went to school, I felt like a loner. And it wasn't until high school that that I that I acquired some friends. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, I joined the the drum line for my school, and that was the first time in my life that I really felt a part of that. I felt that. You know, like Bill talks about in the big book, that camaraderie. You know, I felt that that I was I was equal, and and I I loved I loved what we were doing, and we were really good, and you know we practiced all the time, and that was something that that I put a lot of focus into. Um, and because of that, I joined um, this independent drum line that uh, that toured all over the U.S. that same year, and. Pretty much everybody who was who was in that drum line was in college, and it was me and one other friend that were that were in high school. And so I was excited about this. And one 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 night after like a competition, we we had a real we had a big party, and that was my first night of drinking. When I was young, because of all the stuff that my mom told me, I had sworn off alcohol from an early age. I said that I would never drink. One of my biggest fears was being like my dad. I wasn't going to do it. And I was scared to death of alcohol, um, honestly. And that night, I don't know what it was, and I think I think at this point it's pretty irrelevant, like why I drank. Um, I don't know if it was curiosity or what, but I ended up drinking. And I, I took all sorts of precautionary measures to to set this up. I called my mom, let her know I was spending the night out, like, like my everything was covered all around. All anything that could happen, like like I was safe. And that night I decided to drink. And this party that I was at, just like like the majority of my life, I felt I felt apart from everybody else there. I felt like I was the young kid who didn't fit in. Everybody else was cool. Everybody else was having a good time and I was I was up in my head struggling to to enjoy myself. And something happened that night where I had the spiritual experience of all spiritual experiences, and and that was and that was drinking. You know, this party that that I went to that I felt uncomfortable at, all of a sudden went from from that to, you know, I was the lover of the party. Um, in my eyes, it actually looked like some people might remember the old like Dr. Dre video where he like walks into the the club and there's like smoke in there he's giving high fives to everybody like that's that's the way I felt um maybe like and this this is like a typical like American pie animal house type party like pretty pretty crazy and and I had a blast that night I really did like nothing bad happened I I drank until I until I passed out I felt a part of everybody else next morning I woke up I went and got like McDonald's breakfast and went home um but I think that that I crossed that line in my alcoholism that um, I realized that I had an effect by drinking this this substance um, that that I hadn't ever experienced in my life and I wanted to chase it um, and I did that for as long as I could as often as I could for a long time. I think looking back in retrospect, one of the biggest um, well looking back, I realized that that alcohol had a pretty pretty strong hold on me from from the very get go. Was the next uh, like Monday when I went to school, a friend of mine who was at that party was in the same class as me, and all I wanted to do was relive that moment. All I wanted to do was talk about it. And, and you know, class started, and he, he wanted to get to work. You know, it was time, you know, that was that was the last time to move on, be in the present. And I didn't want to do that, and I made a decision that I was going to do this as often as I could. Now, when you're, like, 14, 15 years old, drinking, it's it's not like I can just go down to the local like 7-Eleven and pick up a six-pack of beer. So it was really difficult to drink as, as often as I wanted to. But I, anytime I had the opportunity, I did do that. Um, and, and I'm definitely not somebody who's going to tell you that my, you know, my worst day sober is better than my best day drinking like that's just not my experience like at the beginning I had a lot of really good times drinking you know I had some of the best times in my life drinking and but it came with some consequences and some of those consequences came pretty quick um I did I did end up getting into some trouble with the law and it wasn't long after my drinking that my mom found out what I was up to and um, 
the Mother's Day when I was, I think, a junior in high school. Stuff had, stuff had started falling off, falling down around me. Um, I started, um, you know, freshman year. I was, I was in school, getting decent grades, holding it together. Sophomore year, you know, on the weekends, I was, I was drinking. By junior year, you know, I was late to school. I was, I was drinking every weekend. Sometimes starting on Thursday, drinking in the morning as much as I could. And um, that year, my it was Mother's Day, and my my mom, you know, I, I I thought I was doing something special for my mom, and you know, we were gonna sit down and watch a movie, and she wanted me to do the dishes beforehand. And I, I hadn't been drinking that night, and. You know, I got into this argument, and I was really, I was really, I acted like a child, you know. I, I threw temper tantrums, you know, all in high school, and I was I was extremely selfish. And, you know, I mean, my cop-out for not doing the dishes was it's Mother's Day, and we need to have a good Mother's Day and, like, not do dishes. And, um, and um, you know, just like a lot of times prior to it, I, I, I got into an argument with my mom, punched holes in the walls, um, you know, t tore the phone off the wall, and my mom ended up calling the, the police on me. And if you would have asked me back then what had happened, what, like, my charge was, I would have told you, like, domestic dispute, cops came, guns were drawn, like, big scene, like, you know, make me seem a lot tougher than I was, but really the charge was unruly child. And that's what I got arrested for that night. And I got put on probation for 30 days. 30 days, that's it. Um, no, three months, three months. I got put on probation for three months. That was it. So I just had to at least just calm myself down with everything I was doing, hold it together for three months. And I tried really hard to do that. You know, I, I, did, I didn't like being under the confines of the court system. And so... Um, so it came, three months came, and, and I had, I hadn't held it together very well, and I went to the courts of, the court to get off of probation, and, and because of some, like, dirty bodily fluids, um, I ended up being put back on probation. And this continued up until after I was sober. Um, so three months of probation turned into three years, and my drinking just took off. And I, from that point, I was in and out of, in and out of uh, in and out of jail um, stuff. My home life became became a mess. Um, when I during this time when I was on probation, I I started to obtain a reputation at school. Um, I started to people started to understand like what was going on, and I tried all sorts of things to hide it and hold it together because this was the only coping mechanism that I had ever had, and. So one day, and I was I was pretty I was pretty regular. Like I would drink at school in the morning. Um, you know, had to get my fix before school. And one day I went to school, and I had I had taken some over-the-counter cough medicine that I had taken before at home. And you know, I had fallen asleep and woken up and couldn't walk and fallen back asleep. And so I thought it would be a good idea to take it at school because at this point my drinking was, I realized that the way I drank, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, I would drink at school and I would black out and I would, you know, get in trouble. And so I was trying to find ulterior stuff to do. And so I went to school and I took these. And um, by my second class of the day, I turned to my friend Ben next to me and I told him what I did. And you know, I told him that I wanted to go walk around. I wanted to go walk around the school. I didn't want to be stuck in class while while I was doing this. And so he gave me his pass, and I wrote a pass to the his plenary. I wrote a pass to the bathroom, and I and I ventured off. And the next, the last thing that I remember was uh, being at the vending machine because he had given me uh, like a dollar to get him a bag of chips. And after that, I blacked out. The next thing I remember was waking up in this sort of grassy knoll area outside of this trailer that my class was in. And I had two teachers standing over me, and they were like, are you all right? Are you all right? And I sat up, and they were gone. And so I didn't know how long I'd been laying out here. I didn't know if the teachers were real or if they were, you know, hallucinations or what. But I knew that, like, I better get back into class. Like, somebody's going to know something's up. So I go up to my class, and I open this door, and everybody's taking notes on this board right here. 
And so everybody's looking at me. Apparently, I'm drenched in sweat. I'm muddy. I have grass all over me. It's the morning, so I was, like, laying in the dewy grass, and I got, like, sticks and stuff in my hair. And and I got really nervous, and I, I dropped the planner, and I just washed the door shut with it on the other side. And if anybody's ever done these, they know that if you try to focus on doing anything, you can't do it. So my mission at this point was to make it to my desk, which was, like, diagonal across the room. So... I tried to make it there, and all of a sudden, my feet felt like they turned into wheels, and I just fell over. I couldn't stand up. I crawled across the classroom while everybody's looking at me, and I sit down at my desk, and I'm just, you know, drenched in sweat, and there was another teacher in the classroom um, who was, who was uh, uh, they had two teachers in the class, and one of them was sitting in the desk in front of me, and she ended up asking me to come with her, and she took me out the door. It was, like, right by my desk that I probably should have come in. And, um, and, and, you know, as I'm walking out, I've realized that, like, you know, my manipulation skills are running. I need, I need to say something to her before she says something to me. Like, point out that, like, I know there's something wrong because if I just play it dumb, like, you know, obviously I'm doing something. So I get out there and I just, I tell her I'm not feeling well. And she's like, yeah, Chase, look at you. Like, you can't even walk. And this, this poor lady had to, like, basically carry me to the clinic of my school. And all the ministers came down. They started interrogating me. And I realized then that I, I had a reputation at school. Like, people, like, this wasn't any surprise. Like, this wasn't, like, an abnormal event for Chase to be doing this at school and, like, causing a scene. And that's that's where I'd went. I had come from somebody who, what, you know, the teachers liked. I did a good job in school, and um, to somebody who was was a nuisance and a, and a troublemaker, and and was drinking and drugging on a regular basis. And the teachers knew this, and um, you know, in and out of in and out of jail. Um, and at this point, I had started losing friends. You know, my 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 home life was was a wreck. I. I, you know, was constantly fighting with people, and, you know, in sobriety, I've had to go over to my mom's house and help, like, patch some holes in her walls that I, you know, kicked in, and um, my mom gave me my, two years ago, gave me my, my six-year medallion, and, and she shared, and she said that when I was drinking, that she was afraid to stand near the stairs with me, that she was a fresher down the stairs, and... You know, that's that's the way my life had gotten. And so I I had started losing friends and I felt I felt I felt pretty lonely. Um all I wanted was to go back to when I was able to drink, I was able to have a have a good life and do what I needed to do and drink, you know, on the weekends. And I saw kids in my school who were doing this, who were active in school, doing what they needed to do drinking, partying a little on the weekends, probably weren't alcoholics, and, and I, 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 I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. And my, that New Year's, 2004 into 2005, I had been invited to two parties. One was in Athens with a bunch of college students at the University of Georgia, and one was downtown Atlanta at, like, at a hotel. And so all older kids. I was really excited because I had quit being invited to parties. And for Christmas that year, um, my mom had told all my family members not to give me any money. And I guess some of them didn't get the memo, got a little bit of money, and I bought a, a big bottle of Crown Royal. And and I, my mission from Christmas until New Year's was to was to not drink it and save it. And and I did that. But it was the, one of the most difficult tasks I've ever had in my life. I remember I put it basically like the farthest you could get away from my door in the bedroom, like piled under blankets. And when I would walk in my room, I almost felt a magnetic pull towards it. I remember holding it and looking at this bottle, and I just felt comforted having it in my hands. And, and it, was, it was actually sort of scary that I had that much uh, dependence on alcohol. Um, I I found out on New Year's Eve that that the, both of those parties had fallen through, um, and I later found out that I was a liability and people people really didn't want me around. And so I called up a friend of mine, and he really he wasn't doing much. And this was someone that I really 
took took advantage of a lot of times. And and I had him come pick me up, and we were going to go see the the peach drop in downtown Atlanta, which is like the the ball drop. And um, neither of us had done that, and so he came to pick me up. And as I'm walking out the door, my mom tells me she wants me to stay home. I mean, she you know she's not oblivious to what's going on. And I. I, I said some very uncalled things to her that I, I, I don't even want to repeat from the podium or from the podium and I, I spit at her and I said, I don't care what you say, like I'm 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 out. I'm going out. And and you know, because that's I I needed a drink. And my friend Evan picked me up and I went and got two bottles of Coke and I fill I I drank a little bit and I filled them up with with Crown, and then I was taking the whole way down the highway, which wasn't very long. I was taking shots of whiskey and, and chasing it with Crown and Coke. And by the time we got down to Marta, the subway system, um, I had just a little bit left, and it, and it didn't take long for us to get down there. I talked to my mom on the phone right before I got on the on the train, and the last thing that I remember was. We, I put all the stuff in my book bag. I had like, I had like changes of clothes because I, I had gotten like pretty used to like when I drank, I didn't know like where I was going to end up. Um, mm -hmm. and so I expected to leave the house and maybe not come home for a week or so. And so I put all this in my book bag. The last thing that I vaguely remember was being in the subway station, a bunch of people, New Year's Eve, we're all going through that little turnstile gate and this guard opens up the the big gate for everybody to pass through and you know everybody's cheering and and I went through I put my hands up in the air and I said I, I'm so happy I don't know why but I'm so happy and then I blacked out um looking back on it I realized that no matter what was going on in my life when I was drinking there was always 15 minutes 10, 15 minutes where alcohol did for me exactly what I wanted it to do. Up until the time that I quit drinking, there could be mass chaos on either side of it, but that 15 minutes, like, I felt, I felt comfortable. I came into my own. And I blacked out and I got on that, that train and, and the rest of the night was hearsay, but, um, apparently I, I got on there. I didn't have the, the, the mental capacity to hold on to anything. And so every time the, the train would start, I'd fall backwards and slide down the train, and then I'd get up and it would stop, and I'd fall and slide to the front of the train. And by the time we got to, to underground Atlanta, I couldn't even stand on my two feet. My friend Evan had to find some, some random strangers to, to take me and prop me up against a building and tilt my head so I wasn't vomiting on myself. And I ended up uh, going into a going into a coma that night and I was taken to Grady Hospital. And that year I didn't I didn't see the new year come in. I was pronounced dead and I woke up New Year's morning, probably about five AM and my mom was standing over me. And at this point in my life my mom had spent New Year's Eve alone, you know, painting, trying to support the family. And because of my drinking I she had lost a lot of relationships in her life because of my drinking. And she was down there, and she was told that she didn't, you know, that her son might not make it through the night. And, you know, there was no one down there to, to console her. And I woke up that morning, and I looked up at my mom, and she asked me if I knew what happened. And I remember thinking to myself that I really hope this has nothing to do with my drinking. Because if, if it has to do with my drinking, then I'm going to get in more trouble. Like, I'm already on probation. I'm... You know, I'm not even 18 years old. Like, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in trouble, and and I can't let that happen because every time I got in trouble and there was another boundary, there was something else put in front of me that made it harder for me to drink, and I needed to drink at this point. And 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 I remember thinking that I hoped that you know I was with my friend Evan, and I hoped that we had been in a car wreck. I don't know if Evan's all right. Um, but I know that I'm alive, and that's what matters, and then I can continue drinking. And she, she told me what happened, and the doctor told me what happened and, and how serious it was. And as my mom's taking me home, I'm, I'm telling her that I wasn't drinking. You know, at this point, like, I believe that if I told you a lie long enough that you would believe it. You know, just like in our book, our life became the only normal one. I thought that I, thought that I could, you know... 
that everything that I believed, anything I told you, could be represented as the truth. And that next day, I'd lost, I had lost that book bag with that, with that little bit of alcohol in it, and I was calling up the hospital looking for the same thing that put me there. And so that was New Year's, and I, you know, I didn't know that that was going to continue for, for another four to five months. I mean, realistically, when I look at an experience like that, it seems like that would be enough for somebody to quit drinking. But it wasn't for me, you know, and I, and it, and I continued drinking for another, uh, for another five months. So during that time, I, I continued getting in trouble with the law. I went to, I started going to court, and they started talking about committing me to the state. They started talking about treatment, and I, I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought that it was something that, like, if, I didn't, if we didn't, like, talk about it too much, like, it would just just go away. And I realized that that probably wasn't going to happen. And one night I was I was at home, and that movie 28 Days with Sandra Bullock was on TV. And she goes to treatment, and they're, you know, singing songs, hugging, having a good time. I was like, man, treatment doesn't look that bad. Like, like it's better than probably some alternatives. So I went downstairs, and I told my mom, I was like, Mom, I think I'm an alcoholic. I think I, know to, I need to go to treatment. She's like, I know. Like, that's what we've been trying to tell you. And so they quickly, like... They quickly set it up where I was going to go to a wilderness treatment center in Montana. Um, and and so I knew I was going my last night drinking. Um, I drank all night long, and I, I blacked out. And I, the, I woke up the next morning. I was in Montana, and I was in an AA meeting. I came out of the blackout in an AA meeting. Um, I have a very vague recollection of, of going to the airport, and um, and I hated it. I hated it when I first got there. I came out of this blackout, and I looked around, and I realized I was in an AA meeting, and this is in Montana. It's a smoke-filled room, and it's a bunch of, like, burly mountain men drinking coffee, and they were talking about the weekend softball game, and I was like, man, this is exactly what I thought AA was going to be like and exactly why I don't want any part of it. Um, cause this does not look fun to me. And, and I stayed in that treatment center for 75 days. And while I was there, at first I, I, I was, I was just sort of playing the part. I was, I was, I was an actor just trying to control everything just so I could get out of there and come home. And while I was doing that, some, some really cool things happened. Was I started, I started building relationships with people. My mind had a little bit of time to clear out, and I realized, you know, looking back at the way I was living, like I didn't want to, I didn't want to go back to that life anymore, you know. And by the time it was time for me to leave, I didn't want to go home. I remember this: the guy came in and woke, tried to wake me up in the morning to go home one day, and I told him I didn't want to go, <laughs> and I tried to talk them into letting me stay for a while, and and when I came home. The one thing that I remembered was, you know, don't drink and go to meetings. And and I didn't I didn't know anybody in Atlanta. And so it took um, I I ended up having to call the central office and find a meeting and, and I and I went to one and, and I really you know, I said it earlier, but I'm really glad that I, I did get sober in Atlanta where there were a lot of young people because I thought that these guys that I'd gone to treatment with in Montana who were from all over the country, I thought that we were like the young people in in AA, like ever, like this this is it. Like you have to go through Wilderness Treatment Center in Marion, Montana, uh, to be a young person in AA. And so I was I was actually like really blown away when I went to my 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 first meeting in Atlanta, which happened to be a young people's meeting. And I was I was in an outpatient treatment program at the time. One of my friends from Montana came home too, who had gotten sober just a little bit after I did. And, and, and we hit it. We hit it hard. You know, we were going to meetings. We were doing the outpatient thing. And he got a sponsor. And he started working the steps. And, and I didn't. Um, I, you know, when I first came into AA and I looked up at the steps up on the wall, I remember looking at them. And, and by the end of the meeting, I had, I had come up with Chase's program of recovery. You know, I looked at step one. I was like, okay, got that one down. You know, step two, you know, I, I believe in God, but I don't see how I can incorporate him into my life, you know. And same with three. Four, four step, sounds a lot like homework, 
you know, fifth step, no, I don't want to do that one. Just sort of went through them. You know, ninth step, like, you know, I'm pretty good at saying I'm sorry. And so I started making amends in treatment, calling up ex-girlfriends, telling them about this bad boy gone good. Um, and then I just skipped straight to 12 of, like, helping people. And I was like, okay, I got I got this thing made. And that was, that was my plan when I got home from treatment. Like, I was going to I was gonna come into AA, steal what I wanted and what, what you had, and and that's that's what I and I was gonna leave, and I realized that that through going to meetings that I realized that I was listening to the people in the meetings and I realized that these are people who drank like I drank, felt like I felt, and that they were doing something different, you know. And I watched I watched my friend who had gotten a sponsor started working in the steps. I realized that he he started to change. He started to do some stuff different in his life. Um, I think Alex said it earlier that that a sponsor was was it you said a sponsor was what was it? Yeah, yeah. My 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 friend basically inflicted a sponsor onto me, um, and and it was and my first sponsor was incredible. You know, I don't know anybody else who's better with working with a young you know, male alcoholic. Like, he just had that, like, gift of, of, of sitting down, explaining stuff exactly the way I need to it explain. And I, when I first got sober, I was so afraid of people. I was so used to, you know, drinking to feel comfortable. And he really made it safe for me. He, I remember him telling me how, you know, everybody, you know, how he would always talk about me and nobody knew who I was and they all wanted to meet me and how I should wear a name tag. And I was like excited. I was like, yeah, they should know me. And so he'd like introduce me to people. And, um, and I started working the steps and I got involved with Geeky Paw. And, and that was just an incredible experience for me because I started meeting people. I started having friends in the program and I realized that like, you know, AA wasn't what, AA didn't have to be what I envisioned it to be. It didn't have to be like go to a meeting with these burly mountain men and like, you know, weekend softball game and, like, if I'm lucky, like, Thursday night recovery bowling. Like, that didn't have to happen. And um, and I'm so grateful that I got plugged in with those people. And my, my first sponsor, he took me through the steps, and we literally, like, sat down and read, like, word for word. And we, you know, he helped me sound out words. And, you know, I wasn't a, I wasn't a very good reader. And, um and, and we just we just plugged away, and and amazing things started to happen. Those promises that it talks about in the book started coming true. You know, I I started seeing some change in my life. Sometimes it was slowly, but I started to see some stuff happen. Um, when I when I was um, when I was involved with Icky Paw, um, I ended up going to my my first Icky Paw, the International Conference of Young People on AI. And that experience changed my life. I had gotten to a point in my sobriety where, where I felt stagnant. I didn't know where to go from here. You know, I'd worked the steps. I, I had my home group. I had done a few things with Kiki Paw and I, and I just, I didn't see any, any growth in myself and I, um, at the time. And I went to my first Kiki Paw and I talked about it earlier today is, um, I got, I got lost and and I I I met up with my soon to be sponsor after that and I realized that he had friends from across this country, you know, that went to conferences and had these incredible relationships and I realized that this is the fellowship that I crave. This is something that I want. And so I continued to stay involved with Gicky Paw. I got involved with Gicky Paw. I got involved in general service and some awesome things happened. And um when I first got sober, I thought that I was going to come into AA and everything was going to be great. Like, I thought stuff was just going to to turn around for me. You know, I often say that, you know, I, like, I thought that, like, I would go to college. And even though, like, I was a high school dropout and, you know, drank all the time, like, you know, someone from some prestigious university would call me and be like, hey, Chase, you know, we heard you do this, but... But you're probably, you know, we think you're probably a good guy. So, well, welcome to college. Like that didn't, that that call never happened. Like I, I continued waiting around for stuff to just work itself out on its own. 
And I realized that it wasn't going to happen. Like, I had to do some work, you know, and I continued to plug away on the stats. And, um, you know, we were talking about it earlier, the circle with the triangle. Like, I, I realized that I had to, I had to incorporate all sides of that triangle into my life. And, and I did that. And my life started coming together. Um, I started, um, being the son that, that I wanted to be, um, the brother that I wanted to be, the friend that I wanted to be, the employee that I wanted to be. And, um, life got good. Life really got good. And, um, about, about two years ago, um, I, got an incredible job that I loved financially. I was, you know, I was self-supporting. I was able to do what I wanted to do. I was there as a son. I was a friend. I, you know, I was going to conferences. I had friends all over. I was so involved. I was like really involved in service work, um, with YPAWS and general service. And, um, and I, and, and a lot of times my sponsor, well, my sponsor used to say that he would talk about these uh, self-esteem as uh, like these feeding tubes of self-esteem. And I think it's completely normal as humans to get to have self-esteem and get self-esteem from certain things. And I know for for me, a lot of times that something really good will happen, and I will, you know, whether it's like the hot girlfriend or I'll get a new car or whatever. And I'll build up this feeding tube where I'm getting all of my, my feel good juice from this. And eventually those, those will get cut off. And about two years ago, like I had, I had it made. I had it going on. And eventually some stuff, some stuff happened. Some of those feeding tubes got cut off. And I think sometimes when I, when I, when I tell my story, the hardest part is talk about like where I am today. And, um, Recently, I've had a lot going on. I, last Monday was laid off from that job. I saw, I saw a couple months ago, it's sort of going sour. We did some restructuring. We, we, we lost a lot of work and, and it's, and it was a mess and I saw stuff falling apart. Um, I had a, I had a company car during that time and I lost that. Um, I, in the last two years, I was like really involved in service a while back and, and I, 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 I rotated out of certain positions, and so I, I haven't been very active in service recently. And I had all this stuff going on in my life that 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 sort of took me a little bit away from AA. And and what I've noticed since I've gotten sober is a lot of times it's not the bad things that happen to us in AA that take people out. A lot of times it's the good things. You know, people come in here and they get you know, the good job, the hot girlfriend, the car, you know, whatever it is, they realize, like, you know what, I don't have time for something. Well, like, I'll push, you know, AA, that thing that gave me this life to begin with, on the back burner. And that's what that's what happened to me. Like, when I had all this stuff going on, and, you know, I wasn't really involved in service work, I didn't have some commitments, and, you know, my work started going sour, I was filled with resentment. I had so much change go on just since the beginning of this year. I ended up having to get a new sponsor. Um, you know, I lost my company car and basically had to buy a car overnight. Um, my, you know, I, my company put me down to part time. And so I, I like financially was really struggling and, and it was scary. And, um, me and my girlfriend move in together and, um, you know, that's been good, but it was, you know, it was, it's been a learning process and, um, it's really been scary, but I put myself away from AA and it took some people really sort of pointing that out to me for me to realize it. And just in the last like month or so, I've, I've really tried to do a lot of work on myself. Um, and that's not always easy. Um, a lot of times I really struggle with, with putting forth the effort. A couple years, or, I don't know, several years ago, I was struggling with prayer, and I called up a friend of mine, and I told him, you know, hey, I'm struggling, like, you know, do you have any suggestions? And I expected him to say, well, you know, light some candles, say this specific prayer, and, like, snap, everything's going to be great. And, and he didn't say it. He said, Chase, just pray. You know, get into the routine of stuff. 
do the footwork and the action, and, and the results will follow. And that's really what it's been like for me recently, is I have, I've had to rededicate myself to the program. And it's been, it's been an amazing experience because even though sometimes it's been a little tough going through this stuff, trying to keep my chin high, get through it, do the work in this program, stay sober, I've had so many opportunities come my way. You know, I've had people reach out to me more than they ever have in my entire life to do different service things. I've been getting phone calls from random people in the middle of the night, you know. I've been getting calls from central office to go on 12-step calls. Like, like it just, like, boomed as soon as I, like, prayed and, like, committed myself. And um, another thing that I've, I've, through the last, like, year or so that, that I've, I've dealt with is um, that me and my mom have a really, a really close relationship today. You know, we, I went from that son that she was afraid to stand by the steps by, um, who told her that he hated her, to every every New Year's now I call her at midnight and wish her wish her a happy New Year's. And two New Year's ago, I call I called my mom at New Year's and her phone was off and I left a voicemail. And, you know, just wishing her happy New Year's. And she called me the next day and she was in tears. And, and I, it, it took a minute for it to sort of register, but I realized that this was a mom who stayed up every night wondering if she was going to get a phone call saying that something happened to her son. When she saw an ambulance go by, she wondered if her firstborn boy was in the back of that ambulance. And it registered that I have a life today where my mom doesn't have to worry. My mom's proud of me. She, she can turn the phone off, have a good night, and go to sleep. And, and that is a true gift. Recently, my mom has been struggling with, with, with her own drinking. She, she's, has about 90 days of sobriety, and I've been able to be the son who can be there for her. And, you know, I, I did get sober young. Um, and sometimes I think about, like, why, why am I still here? Like, like I, you know, I got sober at 17 years old. Like, I think it would be unnatural for me not to think, like, am I an alcoholic? You know, and should I still be here? And I've realized that the reason that I stick around today, it's not from fear. It's not, um, you know, of what, what I think will happen. It's because of the good life that A has given me. You know, when I look at my life and I think, you know, if I add drugs and alcohol into the mix, would my life be any better? No, I don't think so. Is it worth the friendships that I've gained today? No, I don't think so. I've, I, I do have an incredible life. I have problems. I, I go through things. And I think a lot of times those problems are what makes us stronger members of AA. This morning, before I came here, um, I was reading uh, a letter that Bill wrote to Dr. Bob. And I wanted to, to close with, with the last part of that letter because I think it's pretty fitting to where I am in my life today. It says, most of us as, as alcoholics are apt to be all or nothing people. We go to extremes. Either we want perfection by Thursday next or else we want only the barest bit of AA that will keep us sober. Experience seems to show that we can go broke on spiritual pride or on unreasonable rebellion, or just on plain apathy. A plain, everyday desire to make some progress is usually the best and safest bet. However, don't take what I have to say as the gospel. You and everybody have the right to practice AA as you wish. This is spiritual freedom. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.